Good morning, Suzanne here. Details in the box below. This is a short video for the ladies who are unable to attend the, our group meeting today. Uh, we know that you're at home, either sick or looking after somebody. So I'd ask, uh, we pr we're going to pray for you and um, I hope you enjoy this video. So recently, this week, I have been reading three books. This one, Daniel Unsealed, and that's by Nelson Walters and Bob Brown. I've been reading this, The Mideast Beast, by Joel Richardson, and I will be quoting from chapter 6 on page 79. And... Josephus, which um, we will be referring to regarding the destruction of the temple. So, the question is, will the seven years, the Daniel's 70th week, the seven years begin with a peace treaty? And what does the Bible say about a peace treaty. So, I looked through, we all know the one passage to which we refer, and that's Daniel 9, uh, 27. But let's first think, is there anything in the Gospels about a peace treaty? There isn't. Jesus said nothing when his disciples were asking him, uh, he didn't say anything about a peace treaty. Is there anything written by Paul in the letters to the uh, churches? <coughs> Excuse me. No, there's nothing. Is there anything in the book of Revelation about a peace treaty? And there isn't. Now, there's a little bit in Isaiah 28 verse 15 about a covenant with death, but this is because they were relying on a false power instead of trusting in God. So there's something in Ezekiel 38 about unwalled villages, and there's something in Psalm 35, 20 and 28, 3 about deceitful foreigners who promise peace, but there's nothing specifically for end times. Yet we've all been taught it, so where does it come from? There's only one passage, in fact it's only a half a verse, that remotely indicates that the 70th week starts with a peace treaty. Only one. So for something which seems so important, it's strange that there is only one. And this one verse, or one half a verse, let's look at it. It's Daniel 9, verse 27. And the sentence starts with and. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Now that's... That's exactly what we are talking about here, a peace treaty. Now, we know that scripture itself says that every fact, it has to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's what it says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, 1. And yet, most people are adamant that this is absolute truth from a single partial verse. Now, we've been taught, I've been taught over the past 30 odd years, that it is the Antichrist who is going to sign a peace treaty. It doesn't say Antichrist in, in the Bible, in the scripture, when you hear the verse, it says, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. That's what it says. So we have been taught that this is the Antichrist 
he's going to make a seven year con covenant. Now, remember when we did the rules of interpretation and one of the one of the rules, rules four, was that a text apart from the context is a pretext. So let's look at the context. Let's look around this verse. Now this whole section here is called, in, headed in my Bible, 70 weeks and the Messiah. And it says, from verse, so it starts at verse 24 in Daniel 9. 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. This is describing the, the, the reasons for a seven-year tribulation, right? to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity. These things are given. And then it says, so you are to discern, know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuilding Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks it will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress now <clears throat> this is talking about from 586 uh, the decree to restore and rebuild jerusalem to 30 a.d when messiah was cut off would be seven weeks and 62 weeks and without going into detail here, we've done it in our separate study of Daniel's 70 weeks, we know from Sir Robert Anderson, among many, but he was the one person who did, dedicated his life to uh, interpreting Daniel's 70 weeks. And he defined that the seven weeks and the 62 weeks from the decree by uh, 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 restoring and rebuilding Jerusalem to the very day when Jesus um, came, rode on a donkey into Jerusalem was exactly that period of time. And then Jesus was cut off, crucified. But there's still one more point that we need to go on to in Daniel 9.27. The second part of that is it says that he and we're talking now about Jesus, Messiah, will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. Even until a complete destruction, one is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, so we learn that he eliminates Jewish sacrifices at the midpoint. Obviously, Jesus doesn't do this directly. As God authorised the destruction of the temple in AD 70, the same way Jesus will authorise the Antichrist to do it as his agent. And this is, this, this is exactly how God used human agents. And the reason for the elimination of sacrifice in the last days will be exactly as it was for the destruction of the temple. Sacrifices of, of sheep and goats are a crutch for the unsaved Jews. Giving them the erroneous impression that they are, have been granted forgiveness for their sins. Eliminating the sacrifice is one more way in, in which Jesus will call, cause the unsaved to seek the one true source for forgiveness of sins, the blood of Jesus. Now, Nelson Walters says that believing that Daniel 
9.27 is all about the Antichrist puts our focus in the wrong place. Can you see? It's putting our focus on the tormentor and not the saviour. It makes us think that the 70th week of tribulation is all about punishment rather than a time of great heroism and testimony by the church. But now that the book of Daniel is unsealed, we can better understand the role that Christians will play in the great plan which God has ordained for the end of the age. And it gives me great hope. I'm no longer terrified that I'm going to be persecuted here. I see that God will send his Holy Spirit as we need and we will be able to do great deeds in his name and people will see and want and be saved and this perhaps might be a great period of evangelism. God in his mercy does not want that one will perish. It all makes sense to me. What do you think? So that is that first part, seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then uh, to, to the destruction of the temple and the temple um, was destroyed in AD 70. And then there's this period from then till now of undetermined time, 2000 and something years now so far. And then there will be seven years, 70 weeks, the Daniel 70th week, seven years of varying types of persecution. Let me show you what we studied how these are the seven years and these are the beginning of sorrows the birth pangs this is the great tribulation these are the seals the first the first of the six the six seals and the seven seals opens the trumpets and bowls judgment the seventh seal and here is the rapture the abomination of desolation and the day of the lord turns into God's wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist. So this is um, how it works out. So we're saying that the sentence that we looked at, 27, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. We're saying that here, before the start of this, he, whoever he is, and we've been told it's Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. And we've been taught that the, here is the abomination of desolation, which in the time of Maccabees was caused by Antiochus Epiphanes uh, when he took pigs into the Holy of Holies and scattered blood everywhere. And um, that was abomination on the temple. So it's, we've been taught that this is going to be repeated in some form, how, that the Antichrist will set up a statue of himself and, and, have, and decree that he has to be worshipped um, in, in some form. <clears throat> so that's now placing it in context <clears throat> so we've got um so we need to describe di identify where it says and verse 27 and he uh -huh. so i'm going to read from daniel unsealed chapter Article 8, page 122. Now, so, oh, 
I'll, have, I'll go back just a little, a little, into the Daniel's anonymous he, and he will make a firm covenant. Now, Nelson Walters and Bob Brown say that if we carefully examine this partial verse, we find that an anonymous he makes, confirms, or strengthens a covenant with an equally anonymous many for the entire seven years of Daniel's seven year period. So, and as I've already expl explained, the most common um, explanation of this or identification is that he is the Antichrist and the many are the Jews. This isn't the only understanding, however, and many have spent their lives confirming scripture. So, <clears throat> the, the, so who here is the he? Now, when a word like this is used, you need to refer to the name of the, of the last person spoken, the antecedent, that's to, to whom we are referring. So if we look in scripture at verse 26, we see that it's talking about and the people of the prince who is to come. So the prince who is to come. Who is this prince? So we know that he's an end times figure because he's going to come in, this, in the seventh week, in the seventieth week. We know from scripture here that he is going to make a covenant during the seventieth week. So let's see. So I shall read from this book again, page 122. So here he says, there are actually two characters, not one. First, there is the individual we have been analysing, the he, the anonymous he who does things. He makes or strengthens a covenant and he puts a stop to sacrifice and offering. There in verse 27. But we learn now there's a second character who is called one who makes desolate. Now these are likely not the same person. We see that the one who makes desolate comes on the wings of abomination, there in verse 27, and a complete destruction is poured out on him. Now, We've been taught that this is the Antichrist again, uh, but notice the phrase, on the wings of abomination will come one who makes desolate. This passage implies, or it, it even demands, that this character makes his debut after the midpoint of the 70th week. After this midpoint. If this character enters the scene after the midpoint, and if he's given a different name than the anonymous he, they're likely not the same person, are they? They're not the same person, you can see. So they're not. So who is the anonymous he? Daniel tell, tells us there will be a covenant that our mysterious he will either make or strengthen for the entire 70th week. That's what we've been taught, haven't we? He is a pronoun. And as I just mentioned, all pronouns must refer back to an antecedent. So let's read the, now again, Daniel 9, 26 and 27. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing and the people of the prince is to, who is to come, of the prince who is to come, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. Now, 
the last person referred to in that prophecy. Before the anonymous he is the prince to come. We saw that, didn't we? The prince to come. It says it in scripture. That is the antecedent. That is the name of the person to whom he is referring. The prince to come. So when we say, <clears throat> and he will make a firm covenant, we're not talking about Antichrist. We're talking about the person they've just spoken about, the prince to come. You see, that's the key. So, so let's think it clearly. The, the prince who is to come is an end times figure. We've settled that. And he is the one who makes a covenant during the 70th week of Daniel. Probably before, because it's for the 70th week, for the seven years. So, he did not personally destroy the city and the temple in AD 70. We're going back here, 70 weeks of destroyed, being to destroy your people. <clears throat> Rather, it was the people of the prince to come who physically destroyed the temple. Now, the scripture doesn't say whether the people are evil or good. It simply says the people of the prince who is to come who physically destroyed the temple. It's a neutral statement. Daniel 9.26 <clears throat> appears to be identifying the ethnicity of the prince. Scholars have assumed the prince will be of the same ethnic uh, nationality as those who destroyed the city and the temple. So who are the people of the prince who is to come? The people of the prince who is to come. Most people think they're Romans. The Roman legion certainly did destroy the temple in AD 70. They certainly did. They destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. And that was partly fulfilling what was written. But does that make the Roman legion the people of the prince to come? The Roman legion. Now, this is where we look at this, Joel Richardson, and he gives over, as I mentioned before, a full chapter on this very subject. His summary, and he goes into great detail, and I feel a little bit of a, a that it's a bit unfair that when I take Sir Robert Anderson's book, which he took a lifetime to read, to write and research, and I take his one paragraph summary from the end and quote it, I feel like a, a bit of a, a con, but still I'm going to do the same thing. So Joel Richardson, on page 100 of the Mideast Beast, says, um, as and we studied this a year ago in our group, didn't we? Um, gives a conclusion that the armies that destroyed Jerusalem were mainly conscripts. This is the AD 70 destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. They were mainly conscripts. They carried the Roman standard, the banner or the flag, but they were not primarily of Roman eth ethnicity. They were Arabs, and the troops who set the temple on fire were more likely Syrian. Now, Josephus confirms this too. In, uh, in, in one long chapter, identifying them. Uh, but there's another option presented in Scripture. Jesus was very clear that the Jews themselves were responsible for Jerusalem's downfall. Yes, Jesus himself was very clear that the Jews themselves were responsible for Jerusalem's downfall. 
and in Luke 19 verses 41 to 44 the end of that says Jesus is saying because you did not recognize the time of your visitation he's blaming the Jews there read the full passage and in Hosea 13 9 it says O Israel thou hast destroyed thyself but in me is thine help. Hosea 13 verse 9. So we see then, and Josephus, as I mentioned before, supported this view that they were, they were actually responsible for what happened. In other words, Josephus blamed his own countrymen for the destruction of the temple. In his mind, the Jews were the people of the prince who is to come. That would mean Jesus was the prince. Very important. Josephus gives a full, full chapter on this. That's page 384. So, who actually commanded Jerusalem's destruction. God. God himself. Now let's look at Matthew 22, 7. And this is the parable of the marriage feast. Now it takes on. With that in the background, having learnt that, this marriage feast takes on a whole new look. I'll read it all. So this is Matthew 22 verses 2 to 13, 14 and it's the parable of the marriage feast. I'll read it quickly. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Bear in mind now we're thinking of the king will be God and the son will be Jesus. And he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast and they were unwilling to come. The Jews were unwilling to come to, the, to, to, to recognize the savior. Again, he sent out other slaves saying, tell those who've been invited, behold, I prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention, paid no attention. And went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. These now are the, the Jews killing those people who are coming with a message about the Saviour, Messiah. But the king was enraged. And this is the verse I want you to think on. The king was enraged and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. That's verse 7. And then in verse 8 he says, and he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready. But those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. Gentiles. But when the king came to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there, who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now he saw that there was one person who was in his wedding party who wasn't a believer. 
who wasn't clothed in the garments of righteousness. And so he was thrown out and he, was, he would go to the place of gnashing of teeth. Doesn't that make a difference now? So we see that <clears throat> God invites the Jews by sending his son to them. They refuse to accept the saviour, even killing the messengers, the prophets. So God destroyed them and set their fifth city on fire and opened his salvation to the Gentiles. This is now confirmed by the equally valid Septuagint Greek text of Daniel 9.26, and I'll read it to you. After 62 weeks, the anointing, the Messiah, will be destroyed, and there will be no judgment in him, and he shall destroy the city and the sanctuary with the leader who is coming. This text clearly states that the Messiah will destroy the city in AD 70 with the leader who is coming. This was the Roman general Titus. Now, in AD 70, the unsaved Jews in Jerusalem were living in apostasy Having rejected Jesus as their true Messiah, this, the temple supported this apostasy by giving them the mistaken impression that their sins were, give, were forgiven through the sacrifice of blood, uh, of, um, blood of sheep and goats. So if you're wondering why God would authorise the destruction of the temple it was to disrupt this comfortable lifestyle and religious practices of the Jews who failed to recognise the coming of his son. Perhaps it was to drive them towards the true Messiah. So, Nelson Walters concludes, therefore, that it was God who commanded the destruction of Jerusalem using Romans, Syrians and Jews his proxies to accomplish his will. This is an important insight. All three of these nationalities are Jesus's people, in a sense. Although Jesus was Jewish and from the tribe of Judah, all people are from the people of the Prince who is to come, Jesus. Those saved will come from every tribe and language and people and nation who accept his salvation. So this is probably the best sense of the meaning of Daniel 9.26, that the prince did not destroy the city directly, Jerusalem, rather those doing his bidding did so. In this way, Daniel 26, 9.26 is not a verse about ethnicity. It's about agency. Who God used to do his will. Now, so if we have the prince and the people to come associated with the destruction of Daniel AD 70, we need to look backwards and find out who is the prince. So let's look at Daniel 9 verse 25, the verse before, and it says, from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the prince, there will be seven weeks and 32 weeks. Here, Jesus is given two titles, Messiah and Prince. He plays both roles. Then, in the very next verse, these roles are separated, representing the two comings of Jesus. At his first coming, 
Messiah died on the cross. At his second coming, Jesus will return as prince to rule the whole world. And we saw that from our um, study on the millennial reign, Messiah and Prince. And in Daniel 9.26, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So, everybody seems to miss that, but the Hebrew words for Messiah and Prince are identical in the two verses in Daniel 25 and 26. And it's the same person filling the two roles, Messiah and Prince. Why scholars miss this is they fail to recognise that it's God who authorised the destruction of Jerusalem. Who else? Who else? Nothing is done without God's authority, without God's say-so. Everything is under God's control. Of course he is the one who destroyed Jerusalem, using the proxies, the Roman conscripts, using whoever he needs to do it. And he does it for his own righteous purposes. We saw that the Jews were comfortable. They thought they, their sins were forgiven by using the sacrificial blood of goats and, and, and animals. And God didn't want that. Second, they failed to realise, scholars failed to realise that the agents of that destruction, Roman, Syrian, Jewish, are all Jesus' people. All Jesus' people. We are all Jesus' people. No matter what ethnicity or nationality, we are all Jesus' people. So, this now has a major impact on prophecy. So let's read from um, uh, now some Walters again. The impact of this prophecy. A tremendous amount is at stake with the question which was asked at the beginning of our discussion of this article. Will the tribulation begin with a peace plan? Assuming it will, or expecting that anyone who signs a peace treaty with Israel will be the Antichrist, are both very dangerous assumptions and wrongly believing these assumptions will make Christians complacent in their search for the truth about the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel and the identity of the Antichrist. Now, scripture provides one and only one clear sign to watch for and only one way to identify the Antichrist. And that's in Matthew 24, 15. Let's read it. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. That is the sign that all believers are to watch for. And it's the same sign that we see mentioned in Daniel 9, 27. On the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. This, and only this, is the revealing of the Antichrist and the sign that marks the beginning of the Great Tribulation, those last three and a half years of God's wrath. So, let's, let's move on. So, back to Daniel 9.27. It says, And he will make a firm covenant. Now, we've identified that the he is not Antichrist, it's Messiah, Prince to come, Jesus. We'll make a firm covenant with the many for one week. <clears throat> so what is this covenant? 
Now we know from when we did our study of the covenants that it can't be the Abrahamic covenant because the land grant aspect of it is only comes to into effect in the thousand year reign. So it's not the Abrahamic covenant, it's not the Noahic covenant, it's not the Adamic covenant. It can't be the Mosaic covenant because Jesus' blood replaced the need for killing the animals as a sacrifice once and for all. And it can't be the Davidic covenant because that is fulfilled in the thousand year reign. So by process of elimination, it means it must be the new covenant. The new covenant which resulted in the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. Now this is where it gets really very exciting. It changes the whole way we look at the tribulation. The answer is that the new covenant involves an infilling by Holy Spirit. We know in Acts 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this aspect can definitely be strengthened if Jesus is confirming the covenant, the new covenant, might the Spirit lavish his gifts upon the believers in the 70th week, in these, in these end times? Might they include such gifts of healing and miracles? Do you remember Jesus said at one point, where is it? Did I wrote it down in my notes. Jesus said that we would do more than this, heal the sick, and greater works than these, John 14, 12. So, it must be the new covenant in the blood of Jesus, the infilling, the strengthening of the saints in these persecuted times. If demonic power is going to increase, surely so will Holy Spirit power be given to us to counteract this. This is the strength of the Christians. Holy Spirit strength, God-given strength. This is the, these are the extra miraculous powers that God would lavish on the believers during these we don't want to look like weak, poor, persecuted. God wants to show the strength of his, his church, his beautiful bride, who we are in Christ. Nothing of ourselves. We know it's nothing of ourselves. It's all of God, all of Holy Spirit, all of Jesus. And we will be filled with the Holy Spirit and working miracles in these end times. We see that, um, yes, in John 14 too, it says we'll heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you received, freely give, it says in Matthew 10. So will believers raise the dead in Jesus' name? and cast out demons in the 70th week? I believe they may. And I think it's highly likely that Jesus at, at the time was speaking not only to the apostles, but to the believers in the end times. So that um, give us, gives us a focus where we can share our testimony and be strong in the Lord. This is what we should be praying for now preparing for now. But there's still one more point that we need to go on to in Daniel 9.27. The second part of that is it says that he, and we're talking now about Jesus, Messiah, will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering and on the wing of abominations will come 
one who makes desolate. Even until a complete destruction, one is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Now, so we learn that he eliminates Jewish sacrifices at the midpoint. Obviously, Jesus doesn't do this directly as God authorised the destruction of the temple in AD 70. The same way Jesus will authorise the Antichrist to do it as his agent. And this is this, this is exactly how God used human agents. And the reason for the elimination of sacrifice in the last days will be exactly as it was for the destruction of the temple. Sacrifices of, of sheep and goats are a crutch for the unsaved Jews giving them the erroneous impression that they are, have been granted forgiveness for their sins. Eliminating the sacrifice is one more way in, in which Jesus will call, cause the unsaved to seek the one true source for forgiveness of sins, the blood of Jesus. Now, Nelson Walters says that believing that Daniel 9.27 is all about the Antichrist puts our focus in the wrong place. Can you see? It's putting our focus on the tormentor, not the saviour. It makes us think that the 70th week tribulation is all about punishment rather than a time of great heroism and testimony by the church. But now that the book of Daniel is unsealed we can better understand the role that Christians will play in the great plan which God has ordained for the end of the earth age and it gives me great hope. I'm no longer terrified that I'm going to be persecuted here. I see that God will send his Holy Spirit as we need and we will be able to do great deeds in his name and people will see and want and be saved and this perhaps might be a great period of evangelism. God in his mercy does not want that one will perish. It all makes sense to me. 